Welcome to this week's Blue Mondays. Blue Mondays is where we take a look at national, state, and local news through a democratic and really a progressive perspective. On this week's show, we are going to be joined by Michael McHale. Michael McHale is the chairman of the Calcasieu Parish Democratic Party. Over there in Lake Charles, they have a lot going on, especially with the recovery from Rita. Michael's going to tell us how that recovery is coming along, as well as other things that they have going on over in Calcasieu Parish. We have the power to make a real change happen. Education, jobs, the economy, the war. Give a voice in all these issues. Rock the vote! Rock the vote! Rock the vote. You have the right to choose, you have the right to vote, so on election day, rock the vote. If you don't register, you can't vote. So register to rock the vote at rockthevote.com. Rock the vote. 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 Every day. Every single friggin' day. Please. Hello and welcome. Uh, today I am joined uh, by uh, the Calcasieu Parish a Democratic Party uh, Chairman from Calcasieu Parish, Michael McHale. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Stephen. Great to be here. We're really glad to have you here. Well, we thought that we'd sit down and talk about, you know, we're looking at we're about a year after Rita yeah. and the, the forgotten stepchild of hurricanes of last year. Um, tell me, how are things going right now over in your area? It's... I mean, things are so bad in, in Calcasieu Parish and Cameron Parish, Jeff Davis, um, Allen, you know, the, the whole area. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize the devastation that, that we went through. Um, you know, we even have a term for it that we refer to it as red amnesia, that everybody constantly talks about Hurricane Katrina and, and what it did to New Orleans and not taking a, away from that uh, in the least. But we had a second hurricane that came through this state. And, you know, to this day, here we are a year later, and we have you know, hundreds, if not thousands of families who've lost everything, um, communities that were completely destroyed, almost wiped off the map. And uh, I, I don't think that they're getting the, the attention that, that they deserve. And, and it's going to be a long time before we're anywhere close to being back to in what we would call normal. Yeah, trying to find normal again. Uh, uh, so many folks, especially after dealing with it now for a year, I mean, it probably feels like more of a lifetime because of all of the everything that's been going on. Um, you brought up Rita Amnesia. Uh, why do you think that is? Uh, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of reasons for, for Rita Amnesia. But one of the reasons particularly that, that I feel is because I don't think that we have anybody talking about Southwest Louisiana uh, on a national level. Um, a lot of that uh, I lay, you know, at, right at the feet of, of our congressman Charles Bustani. Uh, I don't think I think for the rest of the country to know about Southwest Louisiana, we need to have a strong spokesperson in Washington D.C. who's standing up on the rooftops, who, who's you know yelling at uh, at the top of their lungs. I don't think that we. I, I know that we haven't had that in, in Washington D.C. Um, and I don't think that we've really had anybody up to bat for the people of Southwest Louisiana in Washington, and I think we're suffering because of it. You're absolutely right. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, we look at, it took him, uh, what, ten and a half months to get any of a congressional delegation to get Denny Haster to come down, and then they basically flew over the area and made a few stops in their Blackhawks and went about their merry way, and nothing's been done since. No, I, I, I think, you know, if you look at, and Cameron Parish is a perfect example of Cameron Parish, it, you know, all the debris that still needs to even just be picked up in Cameron Parish. That, you know, whole communities that were just wiped out, um, you know, a lot of people who, and, and these were not rich people. These were not people who had a second home on the coast or, or something like that. These are people that their whole life, you know, everything they had was put into those communities, into those areas. And I, I believe that, you know, our government's left them out to dry. Now, the one good thing that I will say for about the people of Southwest Louisiana and, and a lesson that we've learned is that, you know, that we can't count on the federal government, that, you know, but we can count on our neighbors. That I think the people of Southwest Louisiana are some of the greatest people that you will find anywhere on earth. And we've come together to help each other to, to, you know, to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. But, you know, but that doesn't mean that we're not still looking to the federal government to do what they've promised to do and what they're obligated to do. 
you know, that, that, but we found through hard experience that we can't trust the, the word of our government to do the things that they're supposed to do. You're absolutely right. I mean, we were definitely left high and dry, um, and it's going to come as no surprise to anyone watching this show, at least for the folks that are watching it on our cable access channel here, uh, that we were really left high and dry. You know, the, the, next, uh, the next question is, you know, if we can't count, if we've realized that now, that we can't count on our federal government, um, why are we, you know, we're paying all of these taxes, you know, they're getting all of this money, you know, uh, no offense to New York City, but when they had a horrible September 11th happen to them, they had people rushing to help them. The United States of America, any time they've ever asked anything for the, from the state of Louisiana, we stood up and we've been there. We, you know, we've sent more soldiers to, to foreign wars than any other state in the Union. That, that if you look at a map of the United States and you look at all the pipelines, as far as finished product, as far as natural gas, as far as oil, 90% of them come from Louisiana, and we feed the rest of the nation as far as their energy needs. We've stood up and we've been there for America, but whenever we ask America to, to help us out here in Louisiana, that we're treated like second-class citizens. Uh, you know, perfect example is the oil revenues that they've never wanted to give us simply because that, that, you know, they want to be greedy and take what they can for them. But as far as standing up for the people of, of Louisiana, absolutely not. And we don't have anybody, we don't have any leaders uh, from Louisiana who are standing up in Washington who are standing up for us, particularly southwest Louisiana. The, the one fellow who we've elected to represent us, uh, you know, Dr. Bustani, I think Dr. Bustani is, is more concerned with the rights of cardiologists than he is uh, of the rights of families from places like Holly Beach or Cameron or, or, or Karen Crow or Opelousas or Lafayette or Lake Charles. You're right, you know, and that's interesting. You know, the, the week that he uh, said that he was blindsided by FEMA, blindsided that they weren't going to cover that, he was doing what? <laughs> he would, yeah, he, he, was, he was off visiting his ancestors in, in Lebanon. And, and, you know, certainly I think foreign policy is an important thing. But, you know, but I think with everything that's going through southwest Louisiana and, and in this district right now, I really don't think it's time for him to go have a family reunion. You, you know, know, I think that that's a very valid point. You know, when you look at this, he's not on any international committees or subcommittees at all. Not one of them has anything to do with foreign relations or any of that. But yet, uh, here in a campaign season, uh, while Congress is having a vacation and most congressional people are back in their district addressing the campaign, talking to the people and telling them, this is what I've accomplished yeah. for you, and He's in Lebanon. Stephen, this isn't a typical campaign season. Last year, you know, less than 365 days from whenever you and I are sitting here talking today, we had a major catastrophe of biblical proportions through this district. I mean, literally, whenever I tell you there are people who are still homeless because of Hurricane Rita, who, and these are hard working Americans who, you know, go out and work every day and are trying to, to feed their families and are trying to pay their taxes, but, you know, hard work, who lost everything and they're getting no help from the federal government and yet he chooses that time to go on a, on a vacation. I, I, I find that offensive. I, I think that's, you know, that's offensive to all of Southwest Louisiana. It's certainly offensive to those families in those coastal communities, in those coastal parishes who've lost everything. I mean, you know, we have some serious issues that we need to be addressing here right now. You know, just recently, one of the first things after Rita that we heard because our, our airport in Lake Charles w was pretty much destroyed was that we were going to get a new airport. Well, here it is, uh, again, almost a year later. They haven't removed brick one from the old airport, and suddenly we find out about a, a week ago that, well, now they're not going to build us a new airport. Now they think they can fix the one that we have. Well, they haven't done any work fixing it yet. I mean, if you want to talk about representing the southwest Louisiana, even if you want to talk about doing the things like, you know, bringing economic development, you know, bringing jobs, uh, you know, stuff like that, not only recovering from what we've been through, but helping us grow to be a better place. Look, one of the first things that we need to do is is address our, our transportation issues. And, you know, y'all have a very nice airport here in, in, in Lafayette. You know, Lake Charles, we're not as lucky. Um, you know, but, but even what we had, they won't even fix what we had. We're operating in a temporary buildings. If you're a big business and you're coming into Southwest Louisiana and you want to look at places to put your business and you go and you fly into some place where literally the airport is a tent, how seriously are you going to take that place to say, Oh, look, I want to invest my money here. This is a community that's concerned with growth. And it's not because the federal government's leaving us out in the cold. And why are they leaving us out in the cold? Because Charles Bustani isn't doing his job. 
I couldn't have said it better myself. Could not have said it better myself. Um, let's talk briefly. Um, uh, let, let's talk. One of the other issues that's near and dear to both yours and my heart is uh, labor organizations. Um, we have uh, we had a one uh, a situation that was going on over in your area with PPG. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about sure. that? Sure. The the, uh, the machinists at PPG were on strike for approximately three months um, recently. Um, and the strike wound up ending, leaving people about basically where they left off. And, and let me tell you, first off, a strike is the last thing anybody ever wants to do. It, you know, it's hard on the companies. It, it's it's hard on the unions. It's particularly hard on the workers and their families because I mean, you know, they don't have any money coming in. They're losing insurance coverage during that time. But you know, but these people felt strongly enough about it to where they went on strike. And the issue that way they went on strike about is, and this is what I think is interesting. It wasn't they weren't trying to get higher wages. They weren't trying to to do better. But the company came up with a proposal that, as far as new hires, that people they're going to hire in the future were only going to be paid thirteen dollars an hour and wouldn't get any benefit for the first six months. Now, this is a chemical plant. These aren't people who are making cotton candy. These aren't people who, who are, are building teddy bears. These are people who are dealing with dangerous chemicals, very dangerous chemicals. To me, it, it, you know, someone who's going to be working with stuff like that, I want them to be very highly qualified. I want them to be highly trained. I want them to know what they're doing. And, and I want you to have good people out there. But that's not what the, that's not what the PPG wanted to do. And, you know, PPG, here's a company you're talking about who's coming off 12 straight quarters of not just profits, but record profits. And to me, I mean, you know, business-wise, wouldn't you think, all right, if your company's doing well, well, you're probably doing well because your employees have been doing something right. So if the company's doing well, shouldn't some of those benefits trickle down to the employees? But that's not the way that PPG looks at it. You know, PPG looked at it, well, hey, look, we're doing well. This is our chance to to make cuts to not give the same kind of benefits, to try and cut the, the medical benefits that they're giving to people, to try and cut the wages that they're paying people so they can make more money for their stockholders and leave their employees out in the cold. And to me, the the dangerous part about this is once PPG does it, I think you know other plants are going to follow it as well, that you know we're at a, at a time in America that I really don't understand, that all these corporations, you know, whether it be PPG or, or, or Coca-Cola or several you know, multinational corporations, are making record profits, yet they want to play, pay their employees less. Right. I mean, that, that just that doesn't make sense to me. And I think you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, we're Democrats, we're wild-out radicals. Look, we're just talking common sense. I mean, you know, I know, and I'm a small businessman, and I have employees, and I know it's very expensive to, to give them benefits to pay for health insurance and things like that, but I do. But to me, you know, if your business is doing well, I mean, is you're doing well because of your employees. And sure, your stockholders ought to make money, but not on the backs of and not at the expense of your employees. Right. Just, you know, treat people fair and with dignity and give them the, the respect that they deserve is hardworking men and women who are making your company successful. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, the, the overall situation of labor uh, unions in this country has been diminishing uh, dramatically, I think, in the last, especially the last two decades. Um, we've seen a, a dramatic uh, decrease. Why do you think that is? To a certain extent, I, I think in some ways maybe uh, labor has done their job too well. Um, that I think a lot, of the, a lot of the benefits that, and if you study the history of the labor movement, I mean, these are things that people didn't just sweat for. These are things that people bled for and died for. A lot of the benefits that we now take for granted, like child labor laws, like a 40-hour work week, like a minimum wage, these are things that people fought hard for. But now people think that, oh, well, you know, they, they think that, that these are, are, are things that, that, oh, well, the company would give those to you anyhow. And they wouldn't. They're only there because people fought for them. And if we stop fighting for them, and if we don't have a voice for the working people, then believe me, the, the, the companies are going to, they're going to act in what they think is their best interest, which from what they're showing us throughout the country, the PPG strike is a perfect example, is not what's in the best interest of their employees. That, that, that's exactly right. And when you look at it, uh, the la latest numbers that I saw since President Bush has taken office, uh, three million workers have actually lost 
their health care coverages through their employers. That means they, they had it to begin with. They're still with their employer. And as you just mentioned, corporations are reporting record productivity. Yeah. Well, what is productivity? That's the amount of work that every labor hour is producing mm -hmm. for you. So you can't help but make more money as a corporation to do that. Yeah. But yet we're paying, we're cutting the benefits that people have. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and not just cutting the benefits, cutting the retirements. Cutting you know, all these things that you know, and it used to be in this country that you you know you would take a job, you'd stay with the same company for you know forty, fifty years, and then you'd retire, and you knew what you were going to get at that time. But now that you know companies aren't keeping their word, uh, I think that you know that they're not taking care of their employees, and you know the fact and healthcare is a whole other subject as well. That you know with the price of healthcare skyrocketing, that you know, and I understand that it's making it harder for these companies to provide healthcare to their employees. But look, if these companies aren't paying health care for these people and these people get sick and then they're having to go into the charity hospital system or stuff like that, then who's paying for it? Right. You and I are paying for it. The American taxpayer is paying for it. So whenever companies cut health, health benefits, basically they're just putting that cost onto us, the American taxpayer, and, and you know, that we're all paying for the health care crisis that, that we're having in this country. So let me play uh, devil's advocate here, uh, just because we have such a great uh, person and great quotes that I can go off of from Dr. Charles Bustani. Charles Bustani says, well, but we should have a free market society. You know, anyone, you know, if they don't like working for PPG, they can go someplace else and get a job that offers benefits. What's wrong with that? Well, first off, and one of the problems is that fewer com that most companies are offering fewer and fewer benefits a as it is. And look, I mean, it used to be that that I mean, these are these are families that he's talking about. It's not just numbers. Oh, well, you know, three hundred workers there. You talk about three hundred workers. I mean, the, you're also talking about three hundred families right there that that you're talking about and that, that you're affecting. You're talking about children. You you you're, you know who are, who are counting on their parents for health care, for for food, for education benefits. And stuff like, and whenever these benefits start disappearing, and again, it's not just if PPG does it, then the rest of the companies are, are going to follow suit with PPG, and we're going to get less and less benefits for more and more people, and it's getting harder and harder to make a living in the United States of America. The the the, the middle class is being attacked in, in America, and again, I, I mean, I'm not talking about you know just standing up for for poor people. I'm talking about standing up for hardworking Americans. People who are out there every day working as hard as they can and they're following the rules and they're doing everything right and yet somebody who they have no control over is, well, I'm going to take this benefit away. Oh, well, we're going to cut your retirement here. Uh, your, your health insurance premium is going to go up. And it's hurting families. And, and the fact that, that Dr. Bustani doesn't see that, I mean, you know, maybe it's not hurting the families at the country club. I don't know. You know, uh, maybe it's not, you know, hurting, you know, the, the people in his Mardi Gras crew. I don't know. But as far as hardworking families, you know, people who are doing what's right and who are trying to live the, the American dream, it's hurting them. Well, I think you might be beating up on Bustani a little bit too hard. I mean, after all, he's making $250,000 a year uh, in his insurance claim because he's disabled now because he can't perform heart surgery. And then he's only making a measly about $140,000 from the government. You know, a half million dollars doesn't go nearly as far as it used to. Uh, I I'm sure it doesn't, but you know, I'm sure he's getting all his greens fees and all that you know, paid at the country club. But, but, I mean, regardless of just, you know, beating up on him as an individual, to me, it's not about going after somebody as an individual. It's about standing up for people who they need somebody to stand up for. And, and you know, I'm talking about hardworking people, people who are trying to, who are playing by the rules, who are doing what's right, and, and they're being taken advantage of. I mean, Dr. Bustain is the same fellow who said that he doesn't believe in the minimum wage and he'd do away with, with the minimum wage. I tell you what, Dr. Bustain, I, I'll make it fair to you. Let's just tie the minimum wage to the congressional salary. And every time that congressmen get a raise, let's have a raise in the minimum wage as well. I mean, if they deserve a raise, then those people should as well. I mean, whenever you talk about the fact that if someone works 40 hours a week on the minimum wage, you're still living below the poverty level? I mean, what is wrong with this picture? I mean, to me, that does not, does not make common sense. To, to me, I think that it is and I have nothing against somebody, you know, making money and, and making a, a nice living. I, I, I think that's a good thing, and that's one of the things that America was based on. But I was raised that for those of us who have made it up the economic ladder, it's not just what we should do or what you ought to, but what you have to do, what your duty is, that once you've made it up that economic ladder, is to reach your hand down and help the next guy up. 
And I think Dr. Bustani and too many of these people, they think, well, I got mine, you know, uh, you know, uh, do it on your own. And, and, you know, it's hard for somebody to pull themselves up by their bootstraps whenever they can't afford boots. You're exactly right. Quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. So when we look at the overall uh, uh, situation of the labor uh, movement, um, I'm starting to see a resurgence, aren't you? SEIU. I, I, I think to, to a certain extent, and I tell you, one of the, one of the things I've seen in the last few years, and I think a lot of it is maybe because of the Internet, um, uh, but a lot of it is a lot of things are going on in this country. I think a lot of people are fed up with what's going on right now. And I have seen, and I've been involved in politics all my life, um, you know, raised around Louisiana politics, love Louisiana politics. But I'm seeing people who are getting involved now who've never been involved before. And, and I mean, these are people that, that they want to make a difference. I mean, they're not doing it just because, oh, well, they dislike George Bush or just they're doing it because they want to make their communities a better place. They want to make their state a better place and they want to make America a better place. To me, what the American dream is, the, the American dream is not, nor has it ever been, a white picket fence picket fence and two cars in the garage. To me, what the American dream is, is that my children are going to have more opportunity than I had. And I think that, you know, people have seen that, that that's in danger. And I think people are getting active, they're getting involved. And, and, and I think, you know, particularly, again, one of, if anything good came out of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, if anything good came out of those two horrible tragedies, is that I think as communities, I think that we've really come together, that, that, you know, we've, we've reached out to our neighbors and that people are getting to know their neighbors and their communities better. And people are seeing some of the deficiencies that we have in our society. And they're not saying, why is that there? They're saying, how can we fix that? And, and I think that people are wanting to get involved. They're wanting to make things better and they're wanting to make this a better place. If anything good came out of the hurricanes, it's that. Outstanding. What? Um, so uh, you're living and working in Calcasieu Parish. Right. What? What are some of the things that uh, you guys are doing over there to kind of plug into that sense of community? I, I, I got is and again, as I was saying, over the last few years, I've had more people. Well, I used to have people that would come up to me because I've been head of the Democratic Party in Calcasieu Parish for the longest time, and people would come up to me at a party and. They'd look both ways, make sure nobody wasn't looking, and they'd whisper, whisper to me and say, I'm a Democrat too. Keep up the good work. You know, and, and now more Democrats are, are, you know, people are being proud Democrats. They, they realize that the dangers that our society is in, and, and people are standing up and they want to make a difference. And people are coming to me that they want to get involved. You know, some of the things that we're doing in, in Cactus Parish in particular is I'm a strong believer in grassroots politics. I think that any time you want to get anything done, you got to start at the bottom up. I mean, if you're building a house, you don't build the attic first. You know, you, you lay the foundation. And that's one of the things we've been working very hard on in, in Couchy Parish, that we've been trying to organize precinct by precinct. Um, that, you know, we've been getting precinct captains in different precincts. And, you know, we, we get a list of them of, and in one ways, it helps people get out to meet their neighbors, to, you know, you, you invite your neighbors who, who are around to, to an event at your house, whether it be a gumbo or, or barbecue, you know, depending on the time of year. Um, uh, it, you know, it's a good way to get good food and, and to meet nice people. But, you know, getting people together to make sure that people know about the issues, that people know about the elections that are coming up, that people know their leaders and, and, and who they are and who they're voting for. I think too often in the past, that, you know, most people have made their decisions based on a soundbite or, well, that guy had a funny commercial, so I'm going to vote for him. Uh, uh, people aren't going to do that anymore because they've seen after the hurricanes, I will never again let anybody tell me, oh, voting doesn't matter. Oh, who our leaders are doesn't matter. Because people have seen in a time of crisis when you need your leaders the most, They've seen how important, you know, who you elect is. And I think because of that, people are now taking a lot more care and putting a lot more thought into who they elect and to what position. And they want to make sure that the people are qualified and the people have the same type of values and stand up for the same type of things that they stand up for. It, you know, it's one of those years that, that I think a lot of times whenever people, whenever you've been through something like a hurricane, I mean, it, it's like being in a foxhole in, in a war. And you want to know that the fellow next to you is somebody that you can trust and somebody that you can count on. And we've been through that tragedy. 
And we want to make sure that the people who we got leading us are people that we can count on and the people we can trust. And, you know, I think that a lot of people do get, and rightfully so, get incredibly upset at the two-party political system that we have because in situations where people need a voice, where people need someone to say that that's my representative and he's representing me, we had an utter and absolute failure in Charles Bustani because he was more worried about losing the good graces that he had bestowed upon him from you know Tom DeLay and from those individuals. He was more worried about that than he was of the people in his own district because when we saw him, and you guys saw it as well, on local news interviews that he was giving, he was blaming everything on the federal government. But as soon as he had the opportunity to go on MSNBC, he got on there and blamed everything on the state. Yeah. Now, there's enough blame to pass around. Okay, but the bottom line is he is there to represent us on the federal level and he dropped the ball. Here's the deal to me. Whenever people are suffering, whenever people have lost their homes, whenever people have lost everything that, that they have, whenever they've lost loved ones, whenever literally in Cameron Parish, when you have bodies floating in the streets, when you have whole communities that have been absolutely wiped out, that's not a time to play politics. That's not a time to say, oh, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. That's a time to say that I'm an American, that I'm a Louisianian, and I'm going to stand up for these people who are suffering. When people are suffering, you don't play politics. When people are suffering, you stand up and you do what's right. Regardless of what the political consequences are, you stand up and you do what's right. And you fight and you fight and you fight for those people who need help. And there are people in southwest Louisiana who whenever I tell you, literally, Stephen, whenever I tell you that they lost everything. I mean, except the clothes on their backs, they lost everything. Houses just absolutely wiped out. Perfect example, the whole community of Holly Beach, Louisiana, which is down in, in Cameron Parish, perhaps one of the worst places to be as far as the hurricane, because it was just to the east of, of the center of the eye of the hurricane. And they suffered tornado style winds for about 12 hours before the water even came ashore. The winds up to 150 miles per hour. And after that, the, the wind gauge broke. If I showed you a picture of Holly Beach before the hurricane, small community right there on the beach, probably 600, you know, small homes, camps, nothing real fancy. If I showed you the day after, if it weren't for the water tower, you wouldn't have known what you were looking at because everything was gone. No debris, no nothing, wiped clean. People who lost everything. And those are the people who need somebody to stand up and fight for them. Those are the people who need a representative who's going to stand on the rooftops and say, we're hurting, we're in pain, we need help. And I don't think we had that. Wow. Well, after looking at where we're at right now, why don't we take a look at where are we going in the future? Where do you think Southwest Louisiana is going to be in, let's say, two years from now? Two years from now, we, we still we got an awful lot of work to do. But Here's what I'm looking at, and I think a lot of people in southwest Louisiana, actually I think a lot of people in Louisiana are looking at, is, you know, here we've been through these horrible tragedies. To me, uh, I think every dark cloud has a silver lining. To me, our goal should not be on getting back to status quo, getting back to where we were. Look, we had a, we had a horrible tragedy, but we need to use this opportunity to, to start looking, maybe taking some different approaches on things, to, to be like a, a phoenix rising from the ashes. And we need to come back, not just like we were, but better and stronger than we've ever been before. And like, you know, through the adversity that we've been through, I, I think it has, it's made us stronger as a people. It's certainly made us stronger as a community because it, it's pulled us together. That, you know, that you know who your neighbors are now. That, you know, the people came together and, and helped each other. And we need to keep that same sense of community spirit. We need to keep that same sense of coming together. But we need to look at things not just to bring us back to where we were, but to bring us beyond, to help us to grow and to flourish and become a Louisiana of the 21st century, to, to you know, bring new jobs, new opportunities, uh, uh, new experiences to our communities that we can be and we should be better than we've ever been before. Right. And this is our, you know, and right now that, you know, hopefully, you know, we're going to have the opportunities that, you know, some areas that been destroyed whenever we rebuild them, we're going to rebuild them better and stronger than they've been before. Do you think that we're going to get our fair share on the uh, portions of the offshore royalties? I sure hope so. 
I mean, that, that's been a... We're closer a, now than we've ever yeah, been before. Yeah, we're closer now than we've ever been before, but I know that's something that... You know, Mary Landry's been working on for years and years, and and John Bro worked on you know before that. And every time that we've gotten this close, you know, the year before the hurricanes, that you know she'd gotten it passed through the Senate, and the Senate was you know it, it voted in favor of it, but then George Bush and the White House let know that they weren't in favor of it, and they killed it. Um, that you know all Louisiana is asking for, and again, we're not asking for special treatment. We're just asking to be treated fairly. And that's something that I don't think, you know, we haven't been before. Same deal with, you know, like the money, New York, whatever money went to New York, totally forgiven. Oh, don't even, don't even worry about paying that back. But Louisiana, one of the poorest states per capita in the nation, yeah. and they want us to, oh, well, you know, we'll give you, we'll loan you this money. But even though you've lost a lot of your economic base, even though you've lost, uh, uh, you know, so many homes, so many residents, stuff like that, well, we want you to pay us back in a few years. What is that about? Right. I mean, how dare they treat us, you know, we, to me, and although I'm a very proud Democrat, I'm an American first, I'm a Louisianian second, and, and, and then I'm a Democrat. But as Americans, how dare they treat us differently than any other Americans? And, and uh, you know, I'm normally a very happy-go-lucky guy. I mean, you, you know me, but, but that makes me mad. And, and uh, you know, I'm not going to stand for it anymore. If Charles Bustani isn't going to stand up and fight for us, then we're going to find somebody who is going to stand up and fight for us. That's great. That's great. Well, we have been uh, sitting down with a uh, local uh, activist and uh, Democratic Party member from Calcasieu Parish, Michael McHale. Uh, this has been uh, another segment from us here on Blue Mondays. And, uh, Michael, we greatly thank you for joining well, us it. tonight thank on the show. Thank you for having me. Keep up the good work. We can't wait to have you back. And we're going to be coming over and filming some of your groups over there when we have a chance. So thanks a lot for joining us tonight, and we'll be right back. And that was Michael McHale, chairman of the Calcasieu Parish Democratic Party. Uh, we thank you, Michael, for coming and appearing on our show. We greatly appreciate all of the work that you're doing over there. Uh, our two cities have a lot in common. We share a congressman, and uh, we are the two largest cities in this congressional district. And we look forward to working with you for the years to come. Uh, again, this is has been another Blue Mondays. My name is Stephen Handwork. I am a member of the Lafayette Parish Democratic Executive Committee and your host here each and every week on Blue Mondays. Blue Mondays appears every Monday night at, on AOC Channel 15 at 9 p.m. We'd also like to remind you to click on over to our website at LafayetteDemocrats.org. You'll be able to find a lot of great information on there. For that, this has been yet another week of Blue Mondays. We hope that you'll join us again next week. And until then, 